I'm like, a, I'm such a planner and I'm like, okay, I gotta, usually I have like a schedule. Okay, I gotta be done with a message preparing by this point so then I can just really have my own study time, my own word time that's not really that I'm gonna preach but just help build me up and then my own prayer time and then then I can focus and go back. And so I'm just such a planner on how I've been doing this all and I'll be completely honest that uh, Tuesday night rolls around and I'm like, I have no idea what I'm talking about on Wednesday. Um, and then Wednesday morning rolls around and I'm like, wow, I have no idea what I'm talking about tonight. And then finally, um, I come to the gym and I ride on the elliptical and uh, in my nice boot that I have here. And uh, it's really hard. It's like, it gets sweaty when you just ride a little bike. And uh, finally it hit me, a couple other stuff hit me last night that I was like, oh, maybe I could share on that. And uh, so I, I again, I, I don't have a title for you. And I pray though that this helps you because it's really um, impacted me just today. And it's probably something that I'm just gonna um, have to just go deeper in myself. And so I pray that it blesses you and that you're here on this Wednesday night lead where we can lead each other and help each other. Um, yeah, yeah, they, thanks, Warren. If you didn't notice, Warren's been gone for about two months. Um, people are like, where's Warren at? And now he's here. And uh, we love you, Warren. We've missed you. Try, I'm trying to find the like, right setting on this, on this chair. Um, but have you ever had one of those seasons in your life that everything that could be challenging becomes challenging. Like every little thing becomes a challenge. And in those, that moment, maybe you thought, I'm finally just gonna quit. I'm finally just gonna give up. I'm finally just gonna be done with this life. I'm not talking about suicide or anything, but just giving up. And anyone in here ever felt like that? You're just like, I'm tired of these challenges. I'm tired. Only a couple of people in here. Well, that's good. And we're going to help. We're going to hopefully help everybody tonight. But what I want to say from that is we need each other more than anything. We need each of the people in this room um, and the people that aren't in this room right now that might be here Sunday. We need each other. We need togetherness, not just tomorrow, not just next Sunday, but we need to come together tonight. And I think that's what church is really all about is coming together and forming an actual body of believers that are there for each other and can be there thick and thin and not just, um, I, I say all this because I grew up in church and I've been at church for a really long time, my whole life, actually. I don't think I've ever, not very many Sundays have I missed, um, unless I'm on vacation. Uh, not very many Wednesdays I missed, even on my birthday, you know, I'm here. Even special holidays, you're here. Um, but, and I've been to more services than you could ever even imagine. I've probably more than times I've been to not just this service, but other church services like conferences, then you've gone to Starbucks you've gone to Starbucks a lot probably or as many times as you've gotten coffee I've gone to church more times than that and I'm not saying that um, like hey look at me but a lot of times in different services or church settings I felt out of place to be completely honest I, I felt like man I don't fit in I don't feel the part I don't look the part like what what does looking the part even mean like coming into church um but I, I felt like that. I'd go places and, you know, maybe with dad and I just would feel, and I'm just gonna be honest with you tonight. This is gonna be completely, and like I said, um, I hope it makes sense to you tonight. I just wanna be open, honest, and I think that vulnerable, that's what um, lead is all about. And I, I felt like, man, like people have looked at me or I, I've, I've just felt like, wow, this, do I have a place? In not even this church, but maybe at a different church where I'm like, look at everybody, like, What's going on here? Do I, can I fit in around here? But I want to let you know that tonight, no matter what you feel or how you feel, there's been services I've been at that I didn't feel an encounter from God. I didn't experience God at that service. Not that he wasn't there, but I just didn't, I didn't feel it. And a lot of times we go based on feelings. We, we want to feel the presence of God. And I left there like, what happened? I didn't 
My life didn't drastically change. Nothing, I didn't get transformed all of a sudden or anything like that. But I want you to know tonight, we can still encounter God. No matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you've been through, we can still encounter God. And this service can impact your journey in your faith. This service can impact your journey through this walk of life. And so tonight you can leave here feeling loved. You can leave here feeling valuable. You can leave here hopefully full of hope, full of passion. Um, leave here vulnerable. And uh, that's really kind of, if I had to have a title of this message, it'd be vulnerability. But um, we had staff meeting on Monday and Connor was at our staff meeting. I don't know where Connor, if he's here today or whatever, but he um, he popped in and uh, he came to our staff prayer and he's not on staff or anything, but he just was like, hey, I'm here, let's do it. So he said something in staff meeting though. He's like, we should celebrate more things. And it kind of got me thinking, maybe we should celebrate more things. If you, if you think about just the, the things that we've celebrated in the past, we had like the NBA finals, those were celebrated. You just had the Stanley Cup. Um, a team in Florida won I, hockey on ice. Like, that's crazy to me. But anyways, I know that doesn't matter. Uh, there was Juneteenth. Uh, now we got the 4th of July. We're celebrating Pastor Brody's birthday. There's just celebrations. But as I started thinking more, we should really celebrate more. Maybe celebrate people more. Like, why aren't we celebrating people more? I'm not talking about just on people's birthdays, but like in this church, this is one family. Like, let's celebrate people on a daily, on a weekly basis. And growing up, I've just felt like the church, again, not maybe not this church, or I've just felt like this has been so, yes, we're, we're celebrating Jesus on a, every service, but it's like, what about the people in the chairs? What about their souls? What about their hearts? Like, let's celebrate people. Let's have more events and celebrate. And, and I hope this is making sense, but have you ever had a moment in your life, you had a freak out moment and uh, you said something that you wanted to say for the longest time and you finally like, it just happened, you blurted it out. Maybe you were like in something with your wife or your spouse and it just got the heat of the moment and you just blurted something out that you wanted to say for like the last year, anyone in here? Or maybe it was something else, maybe it wasn't with a significant other, uh, but you just wanted to go off on someone, maybe on social media that they finally needed to hear something and you just blurted it out. Um, there's something in our lives though that I believe um, we aren't telling, we aren't saying, we're holding it in. Uh, maybe things in our life that we're not even telling God and we're not telling the most important people in our life that are the closest people here at this church. We pride ourselves on though being strong. Like, oh, I gotta be strong. I can't let anybody know that I'm going through it. I can't let anybody know that I'm having a bad week or a bad month or even a bad year. I can't let anybody know that I'm going through it, that I'm struggling. But when is the last time Honestly, when's the last time that you you heard from a preacher that you were like, wow, they were so vulnerable up there. They just kind of told it how it is. They kind of told what they were going through. And, and, I, and I don't want to throw any shade at my dad right now or anything like that. He said something a couple weeks ago, and it stopped me for a second. And, and maybe he didn't mean it like this. And again, I'm not trying to, so no disrespect or anything like that. But he said, someone will say, he said, I don't ever tell the church what I'm going through or in these moments, you know, I think he was talking about like people going in the church and telling everybody what you're going through, which that's not something you're supposed to do. But I started thinking why he said that. I'm like, no, tell us, tell us the bad moments. Tell us the times that you struggled. Tell us the times that you were believing God to do something and he didn't come through. Like, I wanna hear those vulnerable moments because I look at my dad, I'm like, now this guy's a superhero. His faith is so big, his faith is so strong. And the problem is we're in church all the time and we're looking at these people on the platform and we're like, they never go through anything. They're perfect. They're awesome. They're in their Bible 24 seven. They're always in prayer. And I'm like, I just need, I need to be vulnerable. I need the people on this stage to be vulnerable and say, listen, it's not all rose, it's not all perfect. I'm struggling, 
I had times where I'm believe, like with my ankle, believe in God, God healed me. And it, it didn't happen. Not saying that it's not going to. And he has done amazing things. But everyone close your eyes real quick. Close your eyes, close your eyes. We're, we're about to read scripture. We're about to read scripture. But close your eyes. I want, if you are in here tonight, because I don't want anyone else to look around to see if you raise your hand. If you are in here tonight, and the reason you came to church is because you want to get closer to God, I want you to raise your hand. Because you want to get closer to God. Now you can put your hand down. Now everyone, you can open up your eyes. 85% of people that go to church, this is a real statistic, 85% of people that go to church, they go to church because they want to be closer to God. But the thing really is, why do we feel so far away from God? We want to be so close to God. That's why we come to church. But why do we feel like we're so far away, though? I want to read a scripture passage, John chapter 1, verse 14. It's in the message translation. Because that's the thing, I think we're all sitting in service and we all have come to church, we're like, I kind of feel distant from God. I kind of feel far away from God. Maybe you're in here and you're like, man, me and God, Pastor Brody, me and the G-O-D, we tight. We good, we good, baby. I ain't got no problems with him. He knows everything about me, I know about him. We have no issues whatsoever, I'm super close to him good for you. I am happy for you, and that's how it should be. But why do the rest of us feel like he's so far away and we can't get close to him? Right here, John chapter 1, verse 4, it says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Jesus said, the word became flesh. God himself became flesh and in blood became a person, and it says right here, he moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one and the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. I want to tell you something like you cannot move into God's neighborhood. God moves into your neighborhood. You can't you ain't going to heaven right now unless you die. You ain't going to God's neighborhood, but he moved into your neighborhood. He said, I'm moving at the house right next door in the cul-de-sac, right beside Brody, right beside Kaysen. I moved right in his neighborhood, right next door. He moved into our neighborhood. God has moved close to us, but we feel so far away. And here's, here's why, because we have mixed up vulnerability with responsibility to get close to God. We have replaced vulnerability with responsibility to get close to God. See, we want seven steps. We want to come to church. We want seven steps how to get close to God. And that would be great. That would be a great book and we'd probably all buy it. How do I get close to God? I want to read these seven steps rather than saying, hey, if you are vulnerable, you can be close to God. If you just open up and finally decide, hey, this is me, this is who I am, then you'd be close to God. But we've mixed so much stuff up with we're responsibility. We have to do this, this, and this, and then we're going to get close to God. Whenever you don't have to do nothing, he moved into your neighborhood. Again, I'm not throwing shade at my pops over here, but right before service, he looked at me, he said, you really dressed up for church, huh? But this, this, is, this is the thing that we grew up in. It's like if you don't wear your Sunday best, are you really going to receive from God? Are you going to hear from God? And God's like, I don't care what you wear. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you just did yesterday. I want to be close. I moved into your neighborhood. Now I probably, could I have dressed up a little more? Yeah, I probably could have. But it's my birthday. I'm wearing the Harvest Church hat. You know, come on now. But we've missed the whole point of God actually moving close to us and we feel so far away because it's responsible. I have to do this, this, and this, and then God will finally do something for me. I have to do this, this, and this, then he will finally heal me. I have to do this, this, and this, and then he will bless me. And we miss this whole point of just be yourself because he moved right next door to you. 
The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. See, we're waiting, though. We come to every service. Man, I'm just waiting for the worship leader. I'm waiting for Jensen to maybe prophesy, give a word, and hopefully it speaks to me. Or I'm, I'm, I'm showing up to church. I hope pastor calls me out and tells me something because then I'll finally hear from God. And you're like, what? Why do, why do I have to give a word that's going to help you get closer to God? Why does my wife have to sing a song that hopefully makes you think, oh, wow, that is for me? If God moved next door to you, though, why are you looking for everyone else to tell you? something when he's right next door and here's the thing I, I have I have friends that aren't Christian anyone else you probably should it's important and now if you have unsaved friends though that are leading you the wrong way then that's one thing we talk about don't have them but I have some unsaved Christian friends and they wonder why we are so stressed out having Jesus being a Christian we're, we're, Christians are so stressed out just as much as the people without Jesus Think about it. You ask everyone in here, you're like, man, are you going through it? Everybody's are like, yeah. You stressed out? Yeah. You're like, so is the rest of the world. Shouldn't there be something different? Because again, though, we have replaced vulnerability with responsibility. So we are working ourselves to the core, thinking, oh my gosh, if I just do this, finally God will notice me. If I just pray really long, finally he's going to come through. But that's what we've gotten to the church today. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 through 10 says, But he said to me, this is Paul speaking, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Man, it's time to let go of what you need to do for God and just be with the Creator. Stop trying to do. Vulnerability will not feed your ego like responsibility will. You know what vulnerability is? It's being needy. It's going to God. And we need to be needy. It's time to be needy with God. Next door. He's right next door. It's time for me to be needy. God, I need you. You're right here already. Let me tell you some things I'm going through. And I said it. It's not about how long you pray. We just did a whole series on living by the book, and it was great, but we got people now thinking, oh, man, if I don't read the Bible every day, is God going to actually be real in my life? If I don't pray for an hour every single day. But it's actually about just being with the one and knowing the God of the Scripture. We talked about it on Sunday. We said, man, you can know the Scripture all you want, but if you don't know the God that's in that Scripture, you're just kidding yourself. And so we're so exhausted just doing and doing and doing these deeds. And, oh, man, did you see what I just did for the church? Did you just see what I just did for God? Did you just see me help this poor lady? Did you just see me? Did you see me? Did you see me? So we want everyone to notice, hey, look, look what I just did. Look what I did. And because we're doing all that, though, we're sitting in church and we feel so far away from God. We feel so far away from a God that just moved in to our neighborhood. Look at this, Hebrews chapter four, verse 11. This is the Passion Translation. It says, so then we must be eager to experience this faith, rest, life. Faith, rest, life. Faith, rest, life. That's what life's supposed to be. It's supposed to be about faith and rest. So we can experience that so that no one falls short by following the same pattern of doubt and unbelief. See, we fall short by not trusting his performance and trusting our own performance. That's why we keep falling short because we are so focused on how we can perform for him rather than what his performance did for us. And once you realize it's him and it's not you, you live that faith rest life.
when you finally let go and say, I'm not telling you to be lazy. I'm not telling you to not do anything at all, but I'm telling you to finally let go and be vulnerable with the living God. So whenever you choose to do that and you be vulnerable, you're saying, hey, it's about what you did and you coming through for me so I can live this faith rest life. We gotta just be us though, be you. Anyone ever heard this? Culture is throwing this down. Our younger generations, throw it's throwing it down all over social media. But anyone ever heard this saying, live your truth? People are like, live your truth, man. Anyone ever heard that? It's just being true. See, Christians though, they're like, no way. Can't be true. I can't be true. I can't let the church know what I just did. I can't let the church know what I just went through. I can't let the church know what I just said last week that I just cussed up a storm at my job, that I just cussed out one of my employees. Well, I can't let anybody know that. But really, culture actually finally got it right for once. Live your truth. It's time to be truthful with your neighbor. It's time to be truthful as a pastor. Pastor Brody, it's time for me to be truthful with you. It's time for us to be truthful with God and stop hiding, thinking, man, if what if he sees what I... He already saw it, but we don't want to come to them. What if people found out? What if, what if the church found out that I just did this? Would they let me come in the doors? I was watching a sports documentary, and uh, it was crazy because you can, you can watch on Netflix. I won't tell you who it is or I don't want to give it all away, but it was this couple, and they were getting married. And right before they were about to walk down the aisle, the guy says, I knew I wasn't supposed to marry this person. And then it goes to the female and she said, I knew I wasn't supposed to marry this man, but they still got married. You wanna know what's crazy though? It's because we are pretending all the time. We got people that are just pretending. Can I be completely, I I told you I'm gonna be like really vulnerable with you. So me and my wife, we got married and before me and Jensen got together, I was engaged to someone else. And uh, maybe you didn't know that, maybe you did. And uh, I was five days away from marrying someone else. Five days away. And I knew it wasn't right for the longest time. You want to know what kept me in that relationship so long and why I was going to go through with it all? Because I was worried about what the church was going to say. I was worried about what the people in the audience was going to say. Oh, my gosh, youth pastor, they just he just broke off an engagement with someone. And I was so worried about people, what they were gonna talk about, how it was gonna maybe affect the youth ministry. What? Because we were pretending. Because we're not being real. We're not letting the truth come out. And so I was about to make one of the dumbest, biggest mistakes of my life, marrying the wrong person because I was worried about the church because I felt that the church would let me down. Not God let me down. I'm talking about the people in the church that make the church. They were gonna point a finger. They were gonna judge. That's how I felt. I don't wanna tell you, I don't wanna sit up here and tell you stories and be like, oh wow, look at Pastor Brody. He's so awesome. He's such a mighty man of God. He's so faithful. I I want you to look at me at points and say that, but I also, I don't want to just play some facade. I want you to, I don't want to be like, I just was in prayer for three hours and this is what God gave me. Are you kidding me? I just, this message like just got inspired like two hours ago because I had no idea. I was in prayer and I'm like, well, God, I got nothing. And I'd be vulnerable with them. God, like I need you right now because I have no idea what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to say. And I'm supposed to lead these people in this congregation. The worst thing that you can do is just keep focusing on your performance rather than his performance. And what is his performance? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's his performance. Second Corinthians 5.21, it says, He who knew no sin became sin so that you could become the righteousness in Christ Jesus. So I want to ask you this. I, we're going to take a little more time. What if you went home tonight and you got real with God? What if you went home tonight 
and you spoke your truth to God. What do I mean by that? What if you go home and you go in your prayer closet, wherever you go, and you sit down, and you just get real with God. God, why didn't you come through for me when I needed you the most? When I felt like you weren't there for me, when we know he was. What if you just get real with him? God, I've been struggling in these finances for years after years, working paycheck to paycheck, and I've been tithing. Why am I still in this situation? Can we not be real with God anymore? What if you go home and you sit down and you be vulnerable with him? God, I'm loving my spouse on a daily basis, but why is this such a struggle? Can you please help me? I'm just saying, why don't we live our truth? Why don't we be real with God? I mean, he already knows everything, right? But we want to keep it hidden from ourself, from the people around us, because we don't want no one to know. At times in my life, I, I just got, I just yelled at God. But we we want to be in charge. Do not yell at God. I can't. He. Why would you do that? I I just got to be real. What if it's time to just speak our truth and know that God just wants to listen to us. God wants to hear us out, and it's okay. Be vulnerable with him. Talk to him. Tell him what. Tell him how you feel. He knows how you feel, but just time to let yourself know how you feel, instead of trying to hide. We see this guy in the Bible. His name's Peter, and one of the twelve disciples, and he's he's the oldest, probably twenty one years old, and he he's the one that we see talks a lot. You know, he he's probably the strongest one. He just you know he's he's the man over all of them basically he's like oh and I'm Peter you know you can read your Bible and Jesus is telling him the disciples he's telling this thing um, right before John chapter 21 and he's telling him he's saying I'm gonna die I'm gonna die and Peter's like I'm not gonna let this happen you're not gonna die in that moment Jesus says get behind me Satan and he and he sits them all down and he's like this is what's gonna go down and Peter's like, no way. I'll fight everybody. I'll kill everybody. No one's going to take you down. I've never been like that. He's like, I'm just going to go. And he's, Peter's like, I'm not going to let that happen. And then we get to this beautiful story. I've told it before, but I just really felt led to tell it again. But we find it in John chapter 21. And I, I really encourage you just, if you have your Bibles tonight before you go to bed, read this wonderful story in um it's a, we, we see Peter, and right, right before we get to John chapter 21, actually, Peter just, he does, he does the unthink. He, he, he just told Jesus, he said, I'm never going to let anyone take you. But then he goes, and he's standing at a charcoal fire and around some junior high girls. And they're like, hey, aren't you one of uh, Jesus's? And he's like, no, I'm not, blankety, blank, 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 and says some pretty foul words. It's like, I'm not, I'm not. And then in that moment, he probably freaks out and runs off and he's beside himself. He's in awe of, I can't believe I just did that. Anyone ever, we've all been there as Christians. I can't believe I just did that. I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I just acted that way, maybe as a Christian. And so some time goes by, and we, we know that Peter wasn't at the cross. Uh, if you read John, you know, he, he calls himself the beloved. I love it. That's so cool to me. And uh, he's, at the, he's at the cross, and Peter wasn't there. And so then some time goes on, and he said Jesus has already appeared to him a couple times. And, but Peter is still just, he's distraught. He can't live with himself. He's so torn up by what he's done. And we've all been there. And he finally says, I'm going fishing. And the rest of the crew, the other disciples are like, you know, since Peter's the oldest, yeah, I guess so. Maybe we should go with him. You know, we lost. 
we just got blown out in this game. We, we basically forfeited. We, let's just, what else are we supposed to do? I'm bored. I'm just sitting around. Jesus is gone. Let's just, let's go fishing because that's what they were good at. In that moment, they go fishing and you know the story. They didn't catch anything that night and the morning's coming up and the sun's coming up and uh, they see a figure on the beach and he said, did you catch anything? No. He said, cast your nets to the other side. Then all of a sudden, fish. And John, one of the, he says, it's him. It's him. Peter's like, oh my gosh. Jumps in the water, swims all the way to the shore. And when he gets to the shore, Jesus is, says it in John chapter one. I'm telling you, this story is so amazing. There's so much to it. Jesus is already cooking breakfast on the shore. He's got fish, bread, at a charcoal fire. It says it in John 21, a charcoal fire is burning. And Jesus is cooking a breakfast. They get all, everyone else gets to the shore. And Jesus says, bring your fish that you caught. But what? He's already has breakfast cooking. Because he doesn't, he doesn't need us. He doesn't need your responsibilities, your things that you're going to do. But he just said, come, I'll take them. I'll take them anyways. But I already have so much for you. You don't got to do anything else. But still bring. Why? Because it makes us feel good. What we bring to God. We're like, God, look. Look what we just did. Look at what we just caught. Even though it was because of him in the first place. But we want to make it look like we did it. So they all sit down at this charcoal fire. And nobody is saying a word. Nobody, they're just looking at each other. And Jesus is feeding. Now, I don't care what, like breakfast is the best meal ever. No matter what, some of my youth are shaking their head over there. It is. You don't know. You're still young. But anyways, and he not only cooked them breakfast, he is serving them breakfast. And they're all probably like scared to talk why I, I i i truly believe nobody's talking because in that moment they thought if they saw jesus again it was going to look a lot different because what jesus was actually jesus was feeding them and serving them and cooking them breakfast and they thought it wasn't going to be like that they thought jesus was probably going to come i can't believe you guys are out here i can't believe you just went back i can't believe you denied me three times they thought it was going to be a bloodbath but here jesus is Serving them, loving them, caring for them, being vulnerable with them. And that's what we think when we mess up. We think the first thing God's going to do is, I can't believe you. When, When we mess up, he's still like, I love you. I care about you. Let me feed you. Let me show you what I still have for you. Let me take care of you. Let me nurture you. And that's what he's doing. And disciples think Jesus is there to say, I saw y'all fail. And he didn't do that. They thought he was going to say, are y'all really Christians? Y'all aren't legit. But he didn't do it. Can I be completely honest? We got some more time in here, right? I was scrolling through Instagram. This was a couple days ago. And, you know, sometimes you're you're scrolling and there's things that pop up that you don't follow this page or you don't, but they're just, they're sponsors or there's like, oh, well, you might like this. And I'll be completely honest. I'm scrolling through and, you know, I like golf and everything like that. And there was a video and there was a girl and she was in a short skirt playing golf. And, you know, beautiful girl. Don't get me I mean, I don't follow this person. We're just going to be vulnerable and real tonight, okay? And I, and I, and I look at it, and it, it, she's swinging. I'm like, oh. But well, then it gets to the end of the video, and then Jesus pops up, and it says, I saw you looking. <laughs> this is what... This is what Christians think, though. When we mess up, we think Jesus is like, I saw that. I just saw you mess up. It wasn't a bad video, but it just, it like, caught your eye. It was, like, kind of funny. Like, you just kept scrolling. Like, Jesus just said he saw that. Like, what? 
But we think when we mess up, Jesus is like, I saw that. You failed. Can't believe you. And it couldn't be further than the truth. See, the first two times, so they're, they're sitting there. They're sitting there. And, and Jesus says this. He looks at Peter. And the, the thing is, everybody knows why Jesus is there right now. Everybody knows Peter denied Jesus three times. It already got out on social media. The whole town already knows. That's why no one's saying anything because they're like, what is about to go down? And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yeah, you know, I love you. You know, I, I just messed up. I know you're here because I messed up. I failed, made a big mistake. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, oh gosh, the second time I messed up bad. I know I did. Three times at a charcoal fire to a junior high girl, he denounced Jesus. Now three times at a charcoal fire on the shore, Jesus is asking, do you love me? Yeah, God, you know, I love you. Third time, Peter, do you love me? started looking into this. The first two times that Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He uses agape. He says, and that is an unconditional love that only comes from Jesus. Then the third time he says, Peter, do you phileo me? Which means an average, ordinary human love. Meaning he's asking Peter, Peter, do you like me? Peter, it says in the Bible, it says Peter gets grieved. He's like, God, you know it. You know everything. You know I love you. You know I like you. You know I care about you. You want to know why Jesus was doing that? Because he was trying to get Peter's eyes off of his performance and onto Jesus' performance. Not on Peter's responsibility on what he's done, how he messed up, but on what Jesus already did. It's not about your performance. Jesus, in that moment, he is rewiring Peter's brain because if he doesn't do it, Peter will spend the rest of his life feeling like a failure, feeling like he messed up, feeling like he can't come back from it. So Jesus is asking him three different times to rewire his brain to get his focus off of himself and his focus onto God's performance. It's about what Jesus did and what he's done and who he is. And so he asked Peter three times because he's waiting for the real Peter. The first two times he didn't get the real Peter. Peter's like, yeah, God, you know, I love you, you know. And then the third time he grieves, you know it, God. He's like, that's the Peter I'm looking for. The drunk fisherman that feels like he's not good enough. That's the Peter that I called from the very beginning. There he is. I love you, Peter. That's what Jesus was doing. So then Peter goes on to write this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, then we're done. He says, in the middle, so be content with who you are. Are we preaching that these days? Are we preaching it at church anymore? Be content with who you are. No, we're not. We're trying to get people, do, do, do this, do this, do this, so then you become better. Do this, do this, then you can be closer to God. And right here, the Bible says it right here, be content with who you are and don't put on airs. How many airs are we keep trying to put on? To make us good enough, to make us special enough, to make us feel like then I can be close to God. God's strong hand is on you. He'll promote you at the right time. Live carefree before God. He is most careful with you. So we're driving to, then, then I'm done. Be content with who you are. We're, we're driving to the softball practice yesterday. And my mom and my brother, they're talking about broken bones and, you know, my ankle. And then my brother had broke his elbow in high school and stuff and his elbow actually came back and it's stronger now he can throw harder throw faster throw further everything we started talking that sometimes when your bones break 
they come back stronger. It is time for us to break ourselves down so we can become stronger. But the problem is we are not breaking ourselves down because we think we have to hold this stature and be so strong so nobody can see. Not even, we don't even want God to see us. But it's time to just say, I'm breaking myself down because I'm just so tired. I'm so exhausted. And then you break yourself down and be vulnerable with the living God. Why? So he can build you back up stronger. Just be vulnerable with him, man. That's all I'm asking you tonight. I know it wasn't probably the best message you've ever heard or something that changed your whole life, but... I just, like I said before we started, I've been in church so long that I feel like I've been in church, but it's been not church. And I want to go back to church where it's like, can we be real? Can we be vulnerable? Can we tell it like it is and not sugarcoating it? And not having that the man up on the platform doesn't have any issues, doesn't have any problems. And let me tell you how you can't have any problems either because the real truth is you're going to have problems. But how you get through those is just be vulnerable with God and talk to him and let him be real to you. Because he's going to talk to you, amen. Let me pray for you. God, we come to you right now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you're just the everlasting, the ever faithful, the ever present God. And we're here tonight just being real with you, asking that you just help us, asking that you just lead us, asking that you just guide us, asking that you get us out of these things that we're in that we're not supposed to be in. But you're not looking at us saying, I saw that. You're not looking at us saying, you failed. But you're looking at us saying, I love you. I still care about you. And I moved into your neighborhood. I'm right next door having barbecues every single day. Will you just come over? That's what you're asking us. That's what you're telling us. And I believe that we can be closer than ever, that we don't have to come in these doors feeling distant, and we don't have to leave these doors feeling even more distant but we can come into these doors and know that we are close with you and we know you and you know us. So I thank you for Harvest Church. I thank you for the lives and the people in this building that they won't feel like that there's not a place for them, that they won't feel like that they don't fit in, that they don't feel like they're being judged. But we look at them and say, you're accepted, you're called, you have a purpose and it's only we find that in you. So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Well, love you. Hope it was good enough for you. Happy 4th of July. Um, be safe. Don't, don't blow off any fingers or thumbs or anything on some fireworks. But go big or go home, right? Sounds good.